eigenvectors and their corresponding, sorry, eigenvalues and their corresponding eigen vectors. And if I want to, I could replace all the words eigen with characteristic. So a kind of a summary on that was these are these are of interest if anything is a times x is equal to a lambda x type problem. So if it ends up being that I have a matrix times x fits out lambda x, if I have anything that ever shows up but like this, this would automatically go to the characteristic values, characteristic vectors, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. And if we're looking for these types of problems and we're looking for the eigenvectors, when we talk about solving these things, it's about finding the lambda and the x's. So the very first thing you do is you take the determinant of a minus lambda i. You set it equal to zero. Once you do this, this spits out a polynomial of lambda, which is a poly of degree n called the characteristic polynomial. So if you just simply take the determinant, in other words, you take the matrix, put minus lambda on all of the diagonal elements, take the determinant of this big thing, it'll end up being a polynomial. Set the polynomial equal to zero, we have to solve it. So the solutions to this, so the solutions find the lambda one, lambda two, up to lambda n eigen or characteristic values. But it doesn't tell you the space that corresponds with each of these particular eigenvalues. So if it's a single vector space, that means you know, a single vector we're talking about it span being a straight line. If I get two eigenvectors that come out, that means that the space associated with it is a plane in terms of its behavior. Uh, the third thing that we then do is we take a minus lambda i i for each lambda i. We go back and we make a brand new matrix. We just go ahead and subtract the numbers that we find. And so if I found that, okay, this five by five matrix, as an example that you could do, ends up spitting out five eigenvalues. Each of those eigenvalues substituted back in by subtraction form five matrices. Each of those matrices, we have to then find its null space. And the null space ends up being the eigenspace, right? It's the eigenvectors that are associated with it. And so what we do is then solve this A minus lambda i i x equals zero to get the corresponding eigenvectors. And I would rather use words like call this the eigen. I like to call it the eigenspace because if it's like it's a span. If I get that one eigenvalue spits out two vectors. This happens on the issue of multiplicity, right? If it ends up being that you had five, but they're all of the same number, that means that this you're not going to get a single vector out. You're going to get several vectors, and so you're going to get a space out of it. Really what we're looking for is this eigenspace. It's just a renaming. of the null space of this a minus lambda i i. So this is our new matrix that we found. For every eigenvector, you get a matrix. Every matrix has a null space. This mm -hmm. null space of this particular thing, because it has a particular application, is called an eigenspace. Some properties when you do all of this, Some properties that show up. Uh, the first thing is solving characteristic polynomials equal to zero means solutions can go across the complex plane. 
And but if it's polynomial, one of the things that happens is your original problem, you know, when we're dealing with these, a itself had real values. It means when we take this minus lambda, this thing up, ends up being a real coefficient polynomial. So it's a polynomial that only has real coefficients. If that happens, that tells you that if you get a complex solution, its complex conjugate has to come. So that means that if you find a lambda equal a plus bi is an eigenvalue, then its complex conjugate is also one. I don't have to even look for it. You find one, it's complex conjugates here. More importantly, if z is lambda equal to a plus bi's eigenvector, then its complex conjugate is the lambda's a minus bi eigenvector. That means if you plug back in, so we go through the problem and I find out that I'm going to have complex conjugate solutions, and so I solve it. Hey, look, I found that it's a plus bi. Oh, look, a minus bi comes along for free. Not only that, if I take the a plus bi, go back and subtract it, do this entire matrix, here's what do we do with eigenvalues once we find them? We take them and subtract them from the diagonal elements to get a new matrix. This new matrix, right, has to, we ask, what is the, we go back here and do this new matrix right there. And I ask, what is the null space of this thing? So I make this into an augmented matrix and solve it. If, if this lambda is complex, that means my matrix has what numbers in it? Complex numbers. So this might look a little weird, but you now have a matrix that has a bunch of complex numbers into it equal to zeros, and now you have to do all the same work, but now we're doing matrices with complex numbers. And so you're going to get eigenspaces still, but they're going to have a bunch of complex numbers. So not only does your arithmetic have to be good, your complex arithmetic has to be good. But you only have to do it once, right? You do it once, and then the conjugates also come along for free. You don't have to solve for that one. Okay. Uh, so just saying Z is the same vector for both of those items? No, not the same. This is a complement. Oh. Right, that just simply says that, let's say that your eigenspace, for example, you do all your work and you found that lambda 1 is equal to 3 plus 2i with, you found out that his corresponding eigens, eigenvector was a 2 and a 3 minus i. That automatically tells you that you have another one, which is what? 3 minus 2i, Three minus two I. but he will have z complement, right, which is what? What's the complex conjugate of 2? Two? 2. What's the conjugate of 3 minus i? Like that. So if I found that the null space of the first guy was 2 and 3 minus i, the next guy will be 2 and 3 plus i. Uh, one of the problems on this is it kind of makes a little bit of a headache when you think about things like this because now we're talking about um, solving a problem that started out with you sit there and you think about, okay, what in the world are you talking about, right? Because a matrix takes a space and moves it to another space, right? And then what we're doing is what do eigenvalues represent. Eigenvalues represent the directions in this space that don't move but rather stretch. So if I had, for example, let's say this is two-dimensional, right? So 
visualizing what's happening here is I have R2 and I'm moving into R2 by some matrix A. And this problem says that, okay, all these vectors here are getting moved somehow, right? I don't know how they're getting moved, right? But it says that in this direction, anybody want to throw up your hands and say, what in the world are you talking about? Because R2 space is a real number, real number object, right? You have these X's and you have these Y's, and this is vector X, right? Which is real, real. And you're telling me that in the direction of 2 and 3 minus i, what direction is that? What this is saying is essentially in, in real space, there are no directions and no eigenvalues. But all real space can be thought of as being embedded inside of a complex space. So if you would say R2 is inside of this larger complex space, not only are you moving R2 plane, you're actually moving it into the complex space. And matrix A for the entire complex space has these directions with this complex value and this complex value that it only stretches along. And it stretches by a multiplication by a complex number. But multiplication by complex numbers are normally in complex space acting as rotations. And so you sit there and you look at your head and it says, well, this causes my brain to hurt. But it's fine. All, all we're trying to do is to say, can you do it? Can you find eigenvalues and eigenvectors? Outside of this, when you get into real applications, and you start saying things like, let's calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and you have a reason for it. I have a physics problem, I have an engineering problem, and I'm doing this. What does complex mean for me? You know, the math just spits out numbers. It's up to the applied person to say, that's what this number means. It's kind of interesting how you look, think about that. It's just like, well, that kind of acts weird. But for our classes, can you do it? So what a complex, or no, what a complex number? It depends. I mean, complex numbers are, for example, uh, you deal with complex numbers all the time in electricity and magnetism. Why? Because they're they're tied, right? They have these effects. One of the things that complex numbers do well is they are a natural representation of handling rotations. But that's just an application. So it really depends. Like, what does it mean? It says, well, it depends on what you are using. Math is a modeling tool. It's what are you modeling? And then you look at what you're modeling and ask, does this make sense for what's happening? And sometimes, like what we do in calculus, is you get a complex solution, just ignore it. Right? <laughs> Why? Because my, my reality is real numbers. So I just say it's no solution. Not within the real plane. But it's also another good example of mathematicians like complex numbers, because they have some very nice behaviors. Things that do not exist in real values exist cleanly in complex. But as far as the eigens go, we need to be able to essentially just solve and find null spaces, except now we're going to throw in some complex numbers. Um, other properties that can show up, and these are quick tests too. The determinant of a matrix ends up being just simply lambda 1, lambda 2. It's the product of the eigenvalues. So that's a quick check. If you have a system and you wonder, um, did I find the right eigenvalues? Multiply them all out. And if you multiply them all out and it's the determinant, it's a good shot that you actually found the eigenvalues. Another one introduces what's called the trace. The trace of A is normally written as TRA is the sum of the diagonals. And it ends up being that the trace of A is always going to be 
lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus everything up to lambda n. The trace is a, is, is a much faster check. Determinants some, is, are complicated to find. Traces are trivial. The trace of it matrix is don't do anything, just add the diagonals. If you add the diagonals, you're going to immediately get out the sum of your eigenvalues. So this is also a quick check. This also tells us pretty easily why is it that solutions come in complex conjugate pairs. Because if one is A plus BI and one is A minus BI and you add those two, what happens to the imaginary parts? They're zero, right? A plus BI minus BI plus BI minus BI is zero. So the imaginaries just go away. And I'm left with real values, which is what I should get. So the trace is a quick check. You can use both of these to simply say, did I do it right? <coughs> Not only that, though, is because these are both true, if A is triangular, it ends up being that if I would solve this whole A minus lambda and then calculating the determinant, the determinant has to be the products, that tells us that the lambda i are just simply the diagonal elements. Note, I use this a lot on exams. So for example, if I ask you to find the lambda i and corresponding X, X's, um, the eigenvectors, and I give you that A was equal to, say, 1, 2, 3, 0, 2, 0, and, one, and 0, 0, 4. And you look at this. Do not do, and I, I even, I'm telling you this right now, you'll, you will, I will give you a triangular matrix and ask you to find the eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. Why do I give you a triangular matrix? Because you do not have to do minus lambda minus lambda, calculate the determinant and all that sort of work. From what this just said, what is lambda 1? One? 1. What is lambda 2? What is lambda 3? That's it. It's not hard to find them. Right? I will give you ones where it'll be you have to do this and calculate the determinant and find the characteristic polynomial. In other words, no characteristic polynomial equal to 0. Right? The values are just the diagonal elements, so we're done. On the other hand, now that that's done very fast, I then make you have to find for, for lambda 1, with lambda 1's eigenvectors. How do you find that? We take 1 away from all those diagonal elements, and what does it become? 0, 2, 3, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, and augment it with 0, 0, 0, right, and solve. Is everybody okay with that? Just looking at this, uh, this row here tells you what's x3. This row here tells you what's x2. 0. zero. And what's x1? Who are the lead variables? What are, where do lead variables occur? First, non-zeros, right? So who are the leads, x2 and x3? What does that make x1? Free. It can be anything. So what does that make x? alpha zero zero which looks like what <clears throat> and so what I would do is just simply pick the best alpha you want so I would say lambda one equals one has corresponding vector which is really a space right one zero zero everything in that direction you okay with that so you have to be good at finding null spaces. 
do you notice that you're guaranteed to have at least, you're always going to have one free variable, right? Why is that? If I subtract on the diagonal elements and they're one, two, four, what's going to happen? He's a zero. If I subtract twos, what's this guy going to become? Zero. And then if I subtract a four, zero, right? I'm going to have a zero on the diagonal element. That immediately tells you you're going to have a free variable somewhere. Everybody okay with that? So, et cetera. So that's one of those ones where it's, it's a trick that you use for giving exam problems. It's like you just look at it. And please don't, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen students do this. One minus lambda, two, three, zero, two minus lambda, zero, 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 four minus lambda, and then calculate the determinant, and they say this is equal to 1 minus lambda times the determinant, and then they have a zero, and they, actually they've gone this way. It's 1 times the, 1 minus lambda times the determinant of that, and then they would say it's going to be 2 times the determinant of this, and then they do 3 times the determinant of that, and I'm just like, oh, you're supposed to, I, I expected you to take three seconds to write that down, and all of a sudden you wasted, you not, didn't waste, you took 10 minutes on an exam, and I'm like, no. So I'm warning you right now, you'll see this. Right? Don't take 10 minutes when I wanted you to take, because I expect you to do more time on the other stuff. All right, 